We're often told that we live in a patriarchy. And the definition of patriarchy is, is woolly. You're trying to pin someone down on exactly what they mean when they use the term. is like trying to nail jelly to a wall. But to my mind, what a patriarchy is, is a society created and ruled by men for men. So in no real way do I think we can be said to be living in a patriarchy. And in part, that is because men get treated so badly in many ways in the society in which we live, though you rarely get to hear about it. Now, when someone will concede one of these points, they will usually say something like, the patriarchy hurts men too, which is innately oxymoronic. A patriarchy failing to serve men is not a patriarchy worth the name. This inequality, this damage that is being done to men is particularly obvious within the justice system and yet very few people know about it and it deals with contentious topics where rightly we want to err on the side of caution and protecting people but it also affects men fundamentally in ways that we wouldn't accept on any other basis the one example that everybody does know, the one example of injustice that everyone is aware of, though not a great deal has been done about it, is when it comes to custody. I think it's something like 80% of the time custody goes to the mother and not the father. People come up with various excuses for this, but the fact, the brute fact of the matter is that 50-50 custody is not the basis from which people argue. It is generally understood across most Western nations, or not exactly understood thought, perhaps is a better term, that kids are better off with their mother, necessarily. And the mother has to be pretty fucking bad for that to change. Now, some people excuse this by saying that men don't go for custody. This is true, but the reason that a lot of men don't go for custody it's because their lawyers, their solicitors, advise them that they're not going to get it. They're unlikely to get it. A man has to be a shining paragon, pretty much, and f who is, to get custody of their kids, while the woman just has to not be a drug addict right now. And even then, in some cases, it, it, it ends up differently. So people are aware of that thanks to the actions of Fathers for Justice. There's other incidents like unreasonable amounts of child support or reparatory payments to a former spouse, things like that, that are inherently and innately unfair and are rooted, I think, in older ideas about how things were organised, that the man was the breadwinner necessarily. So, harking back to what we said about mental health, a, a man who splits from his wife probably won't get to see his kids anything like as much as he wants to, will probably be paying a huge part of his salary out, will be living alone, he's lost all his connections, his, his support group and everything, and poverty is extremely perilous to mental health as well. What can we do about this? Well, maybe we can move to actually making proper judgments without assumptions on what's best for the kids. Maybe we can stop advising men not to fight for 50-50 custody. Uh, maybe we can ch make a change in the culture in our courts to even things out there. Domestic abuse is another aspect of this that some people might be aware of, though it's less commonly known than the issues with child custody and divorce courts. If you're a man you are automatically considered guilty. If, if the police are called to your residence due to a domestic disturbance and they find a, a husband and wife or a boyfriend and girlfriend fighting, it's the man who is arrested and taken away no matter what is actually going on, unless it's hugely egregious and obvious that it's the woman who's at fault. This is called the Duluth model. And it makes the assumption that the man is necessarily much more likely to be the aggressor and, and so on. And there's this huge social stigma, rightly, around men who beat or abuse women in any way. But there's also a huge stigma against 
men who are beaten or abused or, or treated badly by their partners, making them much less likely to speak up. In spite of this, research by groups like Parity and so on suggests that men are as much as 40% of the victims of intimate partner violence. It's probably higher. A governmental survey in Australia suggested that it was a third of, of domestic violence victims are men. And yet there is, perhaps if I'm incredibly generous, one one hundredth of the amount of support for men who are victims of intimate partner violence than there is for women. If that. There are countries without a single shelter for men, without a helpline for men. So this huge number of men, almost half of the total victims of inti intimate partner violence, have, have no help, no assistance, um, may well end up being considered guilty when they're the victim and they've just struck back at some point. This doesn't happen so much the other way around. The women who are allegedly abused, who lash out and even kill their partners, tend to get treated leniently by the system. That isn't right, is it? If there are people suffering, we should be offering them help, and we should be offering them help proportionate to the amount of people that are suffering. It shouldn't be unmanning to talk about the fact that you're being abused. And it takes strength to sit there and take it and not lash back, especially when you're a man, when you're very likely bigger and stronger than the person physically or emotionally abusing you. It's not weakness, it's strength to endure that and not to lash back. If I were to tell you that white people only got 60% of the prison sentence that black people got in cases of like-for-like -like crime, what would you think? You would probably be outraged, I would think. You would probably think that this demonstrated some systematic and systemic hatred and racism uh, within the judicial system as, as a whole. There would be confounding factors, you know, class, wealth, that, that sort of thing, urban versus rural living, but it's still, that would be such a huge amount of difference, 40% difference, that I think it would be undeniable that there was prejudice within the system. That's actually the sentencing gap between men and women for the same crime. Women receive only 60% of the sentence, on average, for like-for-like -like crime than a man does. Is, is this fair? Is this right? Should men be being sentenced for shorter periods? Should women be being sentenced for longer periods? I don't know. I tend to think prison should concentrate on reform uh, rather than punishment, but, but still, that's for experts to argue over, really. But can we ignore that level of, of prejudicial sentencing? Yeah, interestingly, it appears to be not that men are being sentenced more harshly, but that women are being treated leniently. Uh, men in juries, male judges and so on, tend to go more gently on women, a, a case of female privilege, if you, if you will, though I don't think that's a correct use of the term privilege, but an advantage that women have uh, that's not set out in stone, in, in law anywhere. But that's the thing, it is starting to be enshrined in law and so on. When I did my previous video about male sexuality, I talked about abuse and, and groping and so on, and how a mere accusation is often now sufficient, how there have been pushes for inquisitorial justice rather than the presumption of innocence. So these ideas that men are somehow in, inherently and innately bad and wrong and sexual predators and so on, they're not limited to gender studies programs in universities and they're not limited to universities themselves and how they conduct their panels and so on. It's making its way, it's creeping its way into law. Yeah, as we've seen previously, there, there are biases when it comes to divorce courts or child custody, th things like that. 
But these biases are also entering into law in other ways. And even without the law, things are now in such a state that a couple of tweets accusing a man of something is sufficient to ruin his career and make him unemployable and has led some men to suicide. False accusations. There may not be that many false accusations. We don't actually know how many accusations are false or not. But the devastating effect of them on the man who is accused and the problems they cause for women who are genuine victims mean that we should be vigilant and address these. I don't consider myself to be a men's rights activist. I consider myself to be an egalitarian trying to redress an imbalance. But I know a lot of men's human rights activists, for the most part, most of them, are perfectly nice people who have just encountered an unfairness and an injustice, want to see it addressed, and have become frustrated at their inability to get people to even acknowledge the problem. I mean, the, the very concept of men's rights is a laughing stock. And yet, there's a common question that I like to ask, that lots of people like to ask, when a particularly militant feminist is going off about how bad women have it in society, and that is to ask them, what rights in the modern Western world do women lack that men have? And what about vice versa? And they usually start talking about things that aren't anything to do with rights at all whatsoever, but to do with social attitudes. And to police and change those, we would have to step into the realm of thought crime and thought policing, which isn't a step that I'm willing to take. I think culture will adjust itself more slowly, but it will get there. But if we actually think about this and we compare the rights of men and women, you'll find that men do actually have less rights. There are ways in which men are impinged upon, ways in which they lack those rights, which can be properly said to be cases of a lack of privilege. Female genital mutilation is banned. There's been a case in the United States that has uh, reversed a ban, which is unfortunate, but we'll see how that shakes out. But by and large, in the Western world, cutting up a baby girl's genitals or a slightly older girl's genitals, this, this is seen as bad and wrong and unnecessary. While snipping the foreskin from a little boy is not seen as bad or wrong. There's matters of degree, but there are lesser forms of female genital mutilation and there are greater forms. Some are about as or less bad than male circumcision. Then it does have an effect and it can go wrong and about a third of boys on the planet will have their foreskin unnecessarily hacked off. You know, the principle behind this is that this is a child being put through harm, even if they won't remember it, it's still harm to a living human being that is completely unnecessary and is a violation of their personal integrity. In universities and workplaces and so on, your right to be presumed innocent goes out the window if you're a man who is accused of sexual misconduct of any kind. Now, these are just a, a couple of examples. There are plenty more instances in which things are biased one way or the other, draft laws, things like that. And if we attempt to redress the balance by giving women the same duties and responsibilities as men, there is a huge outcry. But then there's no impetus to extend the men's rights. There, there are important issues and they go completely unaddressed and they're desperately unfashionable to even talk about. Most people don't even know about these things, these, these violations, and yet they continue. So maybe there ain't no justice. Zhang. The gallows is cold and the gibbet is lonely, we'll make things hot for you here. I don't like the. I, I have. Okay. Like a lot of you, I hate a lot. 
you know? <laughs> but I hate with style and creativity. 